Well, welcome to the third episode of Silver Lining for Learning. We're really happy that you've chosen to join us. I'm Chris Deedy. I teach technology leadership and policy at Harvard University, and I'm one of the uh, co-founders of this initiative, but it's all bottom up. It's all just individuals who are trying to work together and make a difference. I'm very excited that today's episode is about China. Uh, you can't really see it easily on the video, but I'm wearing a tie that I bought at a silk factory in Shanghai on a trip. And I've found China a continuing source of inspiration in terms of their ability to do things at scale. So I think that's an exciting part of tonight's program. Um, my two co-hosts are Yang and Scott. So would each of you like to briefly introduce yourselves? Scott, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Hi, Scott McLeod, Associate Professor of Educational Leadership at University of Colorado, Denver. I'm Yong Zam from the University of Kansas. Great. So just a little bit about the format of each episode. Uh, our goal is to inspire those of you who are here and then later those of you who are watching. We all want to help each other reimagine teaching and learning to get beyond the traditional models that we almost can't see because we're so used to them and to provide hope in a time of crisis. It's a special time and our episodes are built around how we respond in this special time. We don't want to do the traditional conference things of <clears throat> death by PowerPoint and panels and long talks. Rather, we're looking to establish a kind of informal and conversational dialogue. And we invite our guests to engage in personal reflections, not just to present, you know, sort of research-based evidence. We are not advocating for any single solution. I don't think there is a single solution, but we are looking for pieces of the puzzle. So for example, the fact that China is so good at taking things to scale and reaching tens of millions of students is an important piece of the puzzle. And you'll hear other pieces of the puzzle from our guests tonight. And finally, we're a bottom-up community. We don't have a sponsor. We don't have uh, a funder. We don't have uh, an organization. We're just all working together to try to build a community that can take advantage of the great opportunity that we have at this time of a tremendous human tragedy but it has a silver lining and that's what we're about. So our episode today is about delivering education when schools are closed, lessons from China. Song Ye Chen, who is a professor at East China Normal University is going to provide some big picture observations at the national level in China to give us all some background on that. Spencer Fowler, who's chief executive officer and superintendent of the affiliated high school of Peking's University Dalton Academy will talk to us not only about the challenges of running a school at a time like this, but the challenges of running a school across distance since he is currently in Toronto. And Mina Dunstan, who's principal of the Quarry Bay Primary School in Hong Kong, will again talk about how we particularly help young children and the role of educational leadership in accomplishing that. So with that, I'm going to toss the baton to Song Ye to present some information and ideas about what's happening large scale in China. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yes, um, um, good morning to, from me. <laughs> yeah, to all the audience, actually, it's your um, uh, afternoon. And uh, I'm sharing some of my observations of this uh, COVID-19 educational response uh, from China. Actually, now China is the first country uh, went out uh, of this kind of a pandemic quarantine, this kind of a 
the whole society quarantine. But at the same time, uh, from the educational side, we have all also gone through from the closing school to reopening the school. So half of the uh, country's uh, high school has uh, have already been reopened and uh, more uh, in a row. And uh, it soon we'll see this kind of uh, the routine, the routine schooling will be resumed soon. And uh, I'm sharing this as a first, just as Chris uh, told us, uh, shared that's about this uh, scale. Yeah, China is a large scale and I'm sharing as about this kind of uh, the most from this uh, public education system. And we can see that 90% of the students uh, have already been covered in this uh, public education system. And uh, we have to say this uh, emergency response um, from China that is uh, covered over 200 million students and 10 million teachers from K-1 to K-12, uh, college, vocational schools, even kindergartens. So we see this is kind of wider population um, and the diversified uh, population and also the school types uh, are covered in this kind of emergency response. And uh, one more thing I need to remind is that as uh, what I talked about the teachers, they are mostly, they are associated with this uh, public education system. So their pay uh, are undisrupted during the COVID-19 and uh, they are highly resourceful and very committed. This is what I have already observed. And uh, briefly, I will uh, just uh, summarize this kind of uh, emergency solution as kind of spectrum because the China is very huge. And uh, this uh, spectrum of emergency solution actually have, uh, has been developed through through all four weeks, actually just uh, during our uh, small talks before this uh, show this Mina shared about this the first the three or four weeks is uh, chaotic but however uh, it has already been very responsive the, from the Ministry of Education every week they were issue a, a responsive policy to adjust or accommodate this kind of new changes because no one would know what will happen and so I will briefly uh, describe this kind of uh, spectrum of emergency solution the first is kind of a high-tech uh, synchronous a scheme that is usually the teachers are uh, using this kind of a new uh, live streamed lectures with their students. At the same time, uh, I have already observed this from the this kind of uh, online tutoring industry from the market. They were more uh, powerful to uh, organize this kind of live streamed classes with for example, um, tens or thousands of students are covered at the same time. So it will cost, it will um, this uh, need a very um, powerful brand. This is the internet to support it. And then this is a low tech uh, asynchronous, uh, asynchronous scheme. Usually they will use this kind of pre-recorded lectures. Um, they will show on TV. So this is kind of organized uh, like the local government, like in Shanghai, uh, in Beijing, in Guangzhou, uh, they use this kind of screen. But at the same time, they will um, ask teachers to do this kind of uh, uh, very uh, a short time live streamed interaction with students. And later on, I can show about this kind of a Shanghai uh, model. And uh, all they can just use voice tech technology. They don't have to do all the live stream and you can message them. And uh, the third um, solution is about no tech. For example, they will deliver all the printed textbooks to students and they don't have to get online all the time. And the Ministry of Education emphasized um, from time to time that you don't, want, you don't need to require or ask teachers to do this kind of live stream lectures. You have uh, various ways uh, to use this uh, long period of time. And the force is about this mixed and combined um, solution 
this is a scheme that is just like I mentioned the Shanghai model. They will try to use uh, half of their uh, delivery just uh, from this uh, shared uh, recorded um, lessons. This will have been um, chaired by those uh, master teacher, one master teacher for one course shared by the whole city's uh, students uh, of the same grade. But at the same time, their own class teacher are required to do this kind of interaction. Yeah, so they will have this mixed. And the last one is about the personalized solution in case they don't have any uh, because of this kind of uh, internet accessibility or other um, family issues, for example, for doctors, if they were sent to Wuhan and then they will have this kind of personalized solution, they will send a class teacher or volunteer tutor to help them. So this is uh, the general picture. Thank you, Chris. That's very helpful. And what I'm hearing is a tremendous amount of diversity here, that it's not one uniform model. China's a huge country. Regions are very different from one another. Um, families are very different from one another. And so you have a, a bottom up kind of diversity of models that I think is really exciting. And that it sounds like there's something that could inform almost any viewer of this, no matter what the population of students is that they were looking at. Mm -hmm. So, um, Spencer, can you talk a bit about the the um, the kinds of of challenges the distance provides when you're doing leadership and whatever else you want to add in terms of of how you manage uh, educators across distance as well as students across distance? Thank you. No, it's, it's my pleasure to be a part of this conversation. It's been challenging, but also exciting because the programs that I'm a part of and support are so unique and diverse. And in the sense that we don't use any, any box or, or uh, box curriculum or any teaching any standardized exams. So then how do you maintain and nurture that when it's so bespoke and organic, depending on the teacher and their students. And initially, Initially, when, when things were breaking in China and we had people away for Chinese New Year, we didn't want to fall in that rabbit hole where do we now implement things, implement these structures where it was going to be a standardized system for then all the teachers to follow. Um, and we had those conversations. I'd say that the reason we're doing so well, I would argue, is because of the, the culture and the community that, that we've nurtured and people contribute to. Because people have that freedom and autonomy to then decide what they're gonna teach and when they're gonna teach, how they're gonna teach, what can be complemented, added to it or connected there outside of the school. I think that we found ourselves in, in a really good spot. So the, the initial pushback from the faculty, the departments, the department chairs and their teachers were no, you need to entrust and allow us to run our departments, to work with our students, to make sure that we do have uh, a system in place that's gonna support the kind of teaching and learning that they want. And so we do have we use class in and there are certain platforms that we, that we use, but then the teachers are allowed to to add to that um, and they're allowed to step outside of that. So there were some general agreements that as opposed to having all of our classes being synchronous or or asynchronous, the blend or the marriage of the two. So the faculty are meeting with their students um, for one synchronous class and the other two would be asynchronous, but then the, the faculty also have office hours. And so there's ample time to then continue the dialogue and look at how can we connect the dots here with the knowledge and skills that we're, that we're looking for our students to understand or to master what's, what outside people under projects could they continue to then work with. So this has been really exciting and I think transformational for our community because in the past we've had people working with different professors including Harvard to run these joint classes where then they're working with these outside expertise but now to have classes that are fully online. So it's, it's really pushed some people, in particular those coming from academia, um, to then learn and understand how to use this platform and how to use it well, when some of these academics that work in our program would argue that, you know, the face-to-face -face is the most important. But people are adjusting and they're evolving. And now we have people, I would argue faculty and even students that have really, have really risen to this challenge and that we've seen, you know, for those people that perhaps weren't on our radar of really uncovering or doing amazing things that we're saying, wow, these people who perhaps weren't on our radar are now doing some really exciting work that we want to continue this project. So now we have people who are raising their hands saying, I want to continue this when things are normalized, but I want to continue this project and experiment with our partner schools, sister schools, and also even to open it up to other schools around the world or people around the world. 
we also have a refugee scholarship where we've been bringing in someone from Syria to our campus annually. But now we're saying, you know, we have this one person, there's a great expense that comes with that. But now what if we just open this up, we could scale this up even that much more. I think you're making some really good points, Spencer. And, and one of the things I'm hearing that, that I think all of us who founded this believe is that online learning is not somehow inferior to face-to-face -face learning. It's different than face-to-face -face learning. And some teachers find that they really can take advantage of the differences of online and that they appreciate the opportunity to contact students in ways that aren't face-to-face. -face. But one of our um, viewers, Mark, asks, um, given the responsibility the teachers had and the fact that at least some of them weren't really familiar with the medium, were there special kinds of professional development or capacity building that you tried to provide for them? We've provided some onboarding, but I would say that it's been, you know, pretty gentle in terms of, of how we've um, been educating or supporting faculty. I mean, the one thing that's been great is that we have an ongoing dialogue with everyone. So there's admin meetings that happen weekly, there's department chair meetings that happen weekly, and then within the departments, the teachers are meeting with their, their department chairs. So there is this continuous conversation that can accelerate. We could have them every day, or we could give people a break if they need some time to think and play. So yes, we've looked at what kind of platforms that, uh, that we're encouraging and suggesting that people use, and it allows us to then record and to keep track of the types of things that people are doing. And there has been PD, but it's mainly been coming from the department chairs and then their faculty members. And in some cases, in some cases, it's the students then running PD or workshops for the faculty because then they're wanting them to recognize that, hey, actually, this platform is great, but it can only go so far. And if we adopt this, we can do so much more. We can reach more people. So it's been that amazing partnership and dialogue that, ex that is extended now with the students, the faculty, and as well the, ad the administration. That's really exciting. So Mina, I know that, that many educators in, in the US uh, are concerned when you start talking about online learning for young children. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the models also that are more asynchronous and, and low tech may pose challenges for young children unless their parents are really involved. But we also see sort of anguish posts from parents saying, I'm, I'm trying to do my job at home, and I'm also trying to be the teacher for three younger children. Help, you know, what am I going to do? So we'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts about this and, and how you uh, handle it in your own situation. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank, and thank you, everyone. It's, it's great to be talking and, and actually hearing some affirmations that we're going through similar things uh, in our context. Um, I think that um, certainly uh, parental support and the relationship that you have as a school community with your parent body is absolutely critical at a time like this. And there is a need for um, home and school partnerships to be really genuine and authentic at a time like this. We have had to um, support our parents, I guess, through uh, coming to the realisation that this type of pedagogy is something that really is completely um, different to what perhaps the children would have on a day-to-day -day basis if they're in the building with us. And I, I think that um, our teaching staff have been quite inspirational actually in the way that they have been able to um, guide the parents and support the parents to understand that it is doable and, and certainly um, achievable for young children. Uh, I think that very early on we recognised and were quite open with um, our thinking together that this pedagogy is different and it's going to need to look different because if this is going to be accessible for a young child at home, we've got to deliver it and, and package it in a way that, um, that, you know, that the children can make sense of it. And one of the key uh, things that I would really encourage communities to do uh, when they're starting to establish this type of um, approach would be to, to actually engage the parents in it. So we did a lot of uh, surveying very, very early. So, you know, every um, week we were checking back to parents. We've, we've tried this platform and rolling this out in this particular way. Give us some feedback. And we were very much calibrating what we were doing based on what was coming in from parents. So I think at the start it was quite um 
um, iterative really in that it was changing quite rapidly and it was changing not because we thought we should be tinkering with it, but we were, we were changing it based on what parents were saying to us. And the one key message that come, came out of those early days with parents was it's not the what. We can see what we need to do. It's the how. How do I do this with my child? So what we would do is really think very carefully about the engagements that we were setting and really break down the instruction if it's an instructional type task or break down the visuals or if, if it needed some kind of um, teacher instructional video to go with it or jumping online and doing some lead in uh, video conferencing to scaffold it with the parents that's what we were doing so my big tip would be that um, school communities need to speak with their parents and get the feedback and then shape it with them and uh, the parents so we, we've just finished nine weeks of it uh, on Friday and uh, I had so many parents um, in touch with me on Friday during the you know working hours just saying what we've done and, and how it's going is amazing and they're really quite pleased and we've got children as young as five who are involved in their like online uh, tasking through our Google sites that we've set up and uh, video conferencing, video conferencing as a whole class, small groups, uh, even smaller, smaller groups. And uh, it, it's working because I think we've taken it slowly. We've asked people for their input along the way. We've reflected on what that might mean. And we very much thought about- Put the school not, into the home. Yeah, yeah. We very much thought about the how, not necessarily the what. And uh, I think that that's supported parents. Yeah, because, because it's, it's not possible to make every home into a classroom and, and probably not a good idea. What we need to ask ourselves is, given the situation, what are the powerful kinds of learning that can take place? And the other thing that I, I heard from you that I think, again, is, is something we've talked about as co-organizers, is that education is becoming one in which every stakeholder feels that they have some ownership. The students are feeling some ownership because they're able to teach things to the teachers. The parents are feeling some ownership because they're not just getting orders from the, from the school district. This is what we want you to do at home. And I think that that's going to be a very healthy thing in terms of the, the continuation of education, even past the crisis. Yeah. So I want to invite Yang and Scott, if either of you has a question or an issue that you'd like to pose. Well, I was going to uh, add the, um, uh, the reason we invited three guests and as probably you know, they represent different sectors. I, I would like to, um, I think there's a question from uh, uh, a trend from uh, Vietnam talk about the differences because Mina school and Spencer school, they serve relatively, uh, I think, well to do parents uh, in different places. Shang Ye was talking from a government perspective and uh, rural areas. I would really like Shang Ye, can you show us some of the, the tough situations that people go through and let's see if we can, that can help us think about more innovative ways, uh, ways of doing this. Sonia, you unmuted, sorry. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I will show you some pictures I collected during this uh, period. Yeah, this is the first thing. Yeah, you will see this is a very uh, fancy and uh, well-equipped system for teacher. For some teachers, actually, they were just uh, uh, look like uh, kind of uh, online and anchor and uh, very popular but uh, however for most teachers actually this is uh, the very first time in their life so they were usually joking themselves as a very poorly uh, this uh, poor online uh, anchor yeah and uh, they have to improvise all kinds of equipment and this uh, system to do this uh, uh, live stream and uh, for example they were just uh, use this uh, kind of a self-made system. And then we have this, eh? okay. Even just they will use the glass uh, window or glass door of their washroom, washroom use as kind of whiteboard because that they are not prepared. They were not prepared to do this kind of a home-based teaching. Yeah, so, and yeah, 
others are just uh, show uh, showing this uh, students act. actually they are also showing the uh, vast uh, diversity of this uh, family um, situation this is a uh, you can say very spacious uh, um, apartment and the, this uh, kid is actually doing this uh, physical education class however uh, in the village uh, you will see the students they will have their uh, own bench or desks and just uh, only one small screen uh, mobile phone and to learn and also in this uh, Tibetan area and uh, this uh, a guy from the China Telecom company, they came up and helped to build up this kind of uh, internet facilities to ensure they are accessible. Uh, they were they can access the internet. However, this is uh, all, all those are uh, positive uh, situation. And uh, even in Wuhan, the quarantine cabin, the students can uh, are were also using their pad uh, to do this uh, study. Yeah, this is uh, what I I can share it visually. Yes. So just just a quick one is that um, I think a big question uh, when we raise those things uh, uh, is to say, is the truly online a lot of times necessary for to drive everybody in in some of the poor conditions? That's just my question to raise. Uh, it's not a judgment. We ju I just want the audience, everyone else, to think about this. I think Chris, there's uh, uh, several audience questions you may want to address is about teacher burnout. Yes, we are getting several questions from the audience and we're, and we're putting a tremendous burden on, on teachers, not only intellectually, but a tremendous emotional burden. Um, I, I, and I'm so inspired by the pictures because I see the tremendously great things that teachers are doing you know, there are school districts in the United States that are just basically shutting down. They're not doing anything for anybody. And in, in contrast, trusting teachers to be able to come up with creative solutions, trusting families to be able to, to help serve their children. I think that this is very inspiring for me, but as, as the weeks go on and, and the teachers are serving as heroes for so many people, are there ways that you found that you can support them? Chris, I, I, I'm happy to share there. I think that that's a very real issue. Uh, teachers um, are engaged in the profession because they care. And I think that uh, they, they have found it exceptionally challenging, most definitely on, on all of those uh, levels that you've expressed. And I think that the longer it has gone on, we've seen the morale uh, really ebb and flow. And I have to say that uh, we did a, a whole staff um, share in uh, on late on Thursday afternoon. And I think that all of us accepted and recognized that you know this is going on for perhaps an indefinite period of time and to dig deep the way we have to dig um, is, is 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 hard and I think that to support colleagues to be able to I guess reconcile that and keep pushing on is just about being authentic with each other and actually naming it for what it is it, it's sometimes not ideal, but actually look for the positives that sit within it. And Spencer touched on it before, where he um, said that teachers that perhaps you don't always see kind of shining are actually really um, lifting and, and standing out in different ways. And I think some of those key uh, shapers and influences, certainly in our context, have supported other colleagues to, to feel the strength and, and the motivation to continue. And I think that it's just incredibly important that we have empathy, have empathy for the children and the families at home because they're the ones that are trying to make sense of it and, and be successful in it and um, keeping our teachers um, inspired to continue um, moving forward has had, its, has had its ups and downs but actually when we see the feedback coming back from the children and the work that they're producing or whatever it might be, be it um, uh, you know in an, an online video or however, um, I think that in itself is quite motivating and when you feel as though you're on a bit of a, a dip, you get those moments and it lifts you up and I think it's that strength in, in collegiality and collaboration that's helping. Spencer, do you have things to add? Yeah, just to add to that, I think that 
in general, yes, I think most teachers are overworked. I think that their, their days packed just like students with the kind of classes that they need to be in. And there isn't much wiggle room for them to sort of be their true and authentic self and then to work on their own sort of craft and stay healthy and, and, and focused, you know? And so I think that's something that we've, we've been able to do well and we try to, to maintain that. I think that my job would be more of being there to talk to, to faculty um, and department chairs and even admin around the clock so that I am there supporting them, patting them on the back, giving them that love and, and encouraging them to keep going because the, the work that they're doing is incredible and it's so valuable. So I think that giving them the, the autonomy to then choose, you know, I'm gonna do this one synchronous class and this is the time that's gonna work best for me. I'm in this time zone and we're gonna be looking at in, being in line with uh, the Beijing or China's time zone. So I think as much as possible, making sure that we are being healthy, we are looking after these, these faculty and I think that it's so important. I think that the education system in general needs to look at, you know, how many classes we expect teachers to teach, you know, a week, and then the amount of work that involves, you know, and I think that that prevents the teachers from being an English teacher and being a writer, you know, your art teacher from making art, your business teacher from running their own businesses. I think that these are the things that we need to, to cultivate more of that, but we, we fill their days and we have teachers teaching things that they're not even passionate about. So I think that's, that these are all these mistakes. So I think in this world or in this in this platform now, I hope that people realize that they need that time to stay healthy, to stay zen, and to be creative, and that we need to be there as, as senior leaders in the school to make sure that um, we're there to support them, we're there to encourage them to continue taking risks with, with their learning and their projects, et cetera. Chris, I think that's so just, important. Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. I, I was just, just going to add one other thing briefly, it touches on what Spencer has just shared. I think that the well-being of everyone is something that um, as a leader it, at this point in time, you've got to be so mindful of. So I think, you know, certainly teacher well-being, you know, family well-being, the, the will, but well-being of the child is important. We've been very, very proactive in making that quite explicit to our community. So we've done um, online sessions for our staff so that they can actually um, hear from a psychologist the, the types of things they need to be looking for and recognizing within themselves if they're perhaps overdoing it or they need to get some strategies that are different to, to manage themselves. And we've developed um, same sort of um, approach for families. We've created a wellbeing hub and that's all about um, the five ways to wellbeing for families to look at, you know, being active, taking notice, um, you know, giving. And we've put together a range of resources for them to, to be able to access at home. So you're sort of moving beyond your daily academic um, diet, so to speak. And, and looking much broader at what it can look like. And through that, I think what we're seeing is incredible agency from teachers as, and, and students. And I, th I think that is really exciting, the level of agency. And, and then with that comes then trust and empowerment um, for all, all of those different stakeholders is, is really um, heartening. And that, that makes us um, in, inspired to keep going. So um, one of the questions we're getting from our audience, and, and Songye, I'm, I'm going to ask you to speak to this, is um, assessment. Now, we know that a lot of school <laughs> systems and nations are setting aside some of the standard high stakes summative assessments, which yeah. makes a, a great deal of sense. Um, but still, uh, obviously, uh, diagnostic assessment that's formative for students and teachers is enormously helpful in improving the quality of the learning. Mm -hmm. So I I'm, I'm, uh, would like, uh, Song Ye, you to talk about this from a national perspective and a policy perspective, and then perhaps if the other two of you have any assessment strategies that you would offer to people, that would be helpful as well. Okay, so let, let me show, share a picture first. Yeah, you will see this uh, boy in his pajama <laughs> in his own room. What is, uh, what was he doing with uh, the peers? Actually, this is a tally examination. Okay, this is the situation. Uh, this have been invented during this COVID-19 in case if they were, um, ask that you do this kind of uh, uh, public examination, especially for the two, two grades. The first is the uh, K-12, 
yeah, because they are facing this public examination, the National College Entrance Examination. And in a recent history, it uh, this um, national public examination was just announced to be delayed for one month. Yeah, so it allowed the the whole population, the, the, the students in the final year to um, prepare for well, over one more um, month. And uh, for this kind of a K-9, if they were going to the high school, senior high school, so they are still facing this kind of public examination and they need to have this kind of a mock examination. And so when they are doing this mock examination, they're using something like this kind of video conferencing, but however, so use that kind of as a monitor and the surveillance and to do this, uh, but they also ask that the parents to collaborate and to sign this kind of agreement and also they were um, do the kind of a pledge something like this to ensure they were um, very honest they will have no cheating there but in other ways actually the government's attitude is no more anxiety no more tests and uh, they are going to ask the, those schools to uh, start from the very beginning, they will say this kind of a zero beginning of teaching when the schools are reopened. So they will try to reduce this kind of a tax anxiety. They try to minimize this assessment. However, the teachers will still use this kind of a daily base if they can be touched uh, if the uh, students can be connected on this kind of a daily base they will have this kind of a daily uh, feedback uh, to the students um, uh, homework or assignment but usually they were just they know okay this is a special time and they will not make a kind of a compulsory requirement yeah so so scott do you have a theme that you want to bring up at this point yeah, kind of spinning off of this, you know, some thoughts that are running through my head and we're hearing it a lot in our uh, viewers as well is there seems to be a qualitative difference uh, between sort of what Spencer and Mina are talking about and the kind of pictures that Sean Ye are is sharing with us. So it feels like the education that and the flexibility and the autonomy and the trust and the student agency that Mina and Spencer have been talking a lot about um, didn't feel like that was as present in the pictures that shang -E was sharing. And I don't know if that's because of assessment or if it's more around a curriculum, right? I know that, you know, there are provincial or city curricula that teachers are expected to follow, for example, where, may, where maybe in the uh, international schools there may be some more curricular flexibility, for example, or something. But it, you know, it seemed like the kinds of things that Spencer and Mina were talking about in terms of being able to deviate and give teachers trust and go off here, whereas it looked like we had a lot of uh, a variety of attempts to engage in direct instruction in the pictures that were shared with us. And I don't know if that's a fair observation or not. I wonder if the three of you could talk to us about that. I, I just jump in uh, with that because I was going to invite both Sean and Mina and Spencer to come talk about how curriculum has been reframed. Uh, even uh, I think what Shuangyi was talking about, those two grades, grade nine and grades 12, they are very high stakes testing that determines where you go, very high stakes, you know, so that people cannot deviate too much and that's very most nervous. But in the other places, I think I, I heard from both Shuangyi and Mina and Spencer about actually rethink about the curriculum. This morning I was reading news, even the Beijing Education Commission, the government in Beijing, uh, came up with a new announcement. In essence, they, I don't think those kids can return to school. So they are encouraging talk about bigger unit, um, merge subjects, which is actually unusual in, in China, which is quite revolutionary to say, we don't have time. Let's just merge the subjects, merge the topics and expand the units. We don't try to do this detailed things. Uh, you know, I think that's a, that seems to be a forced curriculum reform. That's very interesting. And I heard a lot from Mina. Mina, you want to elaborate a lot, a lot about because you and I talked a lot about how you, your staff have been thinking about what's necessary to be taught. 
Yes, indeed. Um, we, uh, I mean, being a primary context, we uh, fortunately haven't had some of those challenges around high stakes testing and, and cancellations that have affected other sectors. But um, I think for us, and th this is through conversation with, with teaching staff, they have said quite regularly, it's really making me think what do I need to actually be preparing for the children? What's really important for them? And, and we basically had to strip out so much stuff, um, you know, learning objectives, outcomes that we previously would have thought is really crucial that, you know, as part of this unit, we are making sure that these objectives are part of the mix. That's had to be completely stopped and upended. And I think what it's doing is sharpening teachers' um, minds to this is this is really core learning and this is going to stay but lots of other stuff has to go and that process of letting go of a lot of things so that you're really identifying specifically what it is and what's the purpose behind it and then designing assessments whether it's you know a, a formative process or however it's being delivered that's then enabling teachers to seek the feedback they need and finding out well actually we don't need to spend much more time on this. We're going to, we're going to take this in a slightly different direction. Um, it's, it's radical thinking for us at the moment. There are a group of us um, at Quarry Bay that are, are wondering how can we keep some of these tangibles that are going on right now in our working lives and bring them back into our day-to-day -day working once children return to the building? And does it mean that we can actually have the permission to go forward with a lot less within the curriculum content that we're trying to deliver. And I think that the, the one message that I'm hearing from teachers when we're talking about it is, Mina, it's about the skills. We need to really start to be thinking about the skills that we're developing in children more so than just looking at you know, loads and loads of learning outcomes and objectives that perhaps pr previously have driven a lot of the design of learning tasks. So yes, you've got to strip it out. And um, it's really, really forcing us um, to think about the skills and the dispositions in a learner that are really key. Because at this time, you can't have loads of stuff in there that's getting in the way. So um, dispositionally, it's impacting on teachers and teachers are thinking about that and it's certainly uh, the, the children too. I would just like to add about assessment that, um, I mean, my fear was that now that we're completely virtual and we don't have students working at different labs at universities or working with different people in industry, or how can they still, but remotely or virtually, so that so that p teachers don't feel pressured to then have the, the traditional quizzes and exams and papers, you know? And I think that what's been great to see is that they're staying true to this um, school within a school, this experimental school that, again, we look at everything as an, as an experiment. So to then not fall in that trap of then doing what's traditional, but looking at the, the curriculum as this base of a tree and then the branches being the students can take it anywhere they want. So how do we, how do I, how do they assess it? How do we have that dialogue, that running record, so to speak? And we've seen that it's been, it's been really inspirational for teachers who then, who are running lecture series and also students, because if you think about WeChat and other platforms in China, they've been able to really extend uh, their knowledge and skills as a beacon of voice for others. I mean, getting hundreds of thousands of, of hits and followers, et cetera. So we've, we've seen that continue, but I think that you know, my job or your job or others, when we don't, when we're not teaching a standardized curriculum and we're not teaching to the SAT or ACT, then we need to remind folks who might be a little more conservative than their peers that there's, there's, there's a time for, for quizzes and exams, et cetera, but why don't we continue to try and push the envelope of teaching and learning and how we could assess um, the students and their capabilities, et cetera. So one thing that's coming out is we've we've heard about a, a lot of exciting things that are happening that weren't happening before. I mean, we talk a lot about what the crisis has taken away, but the crisis has also given us some things. And many of our participants have asked, what do you think is gonna happen when the crisis recedes and everybody goes back to school? Without worrying about a timetable, do you think it's gonna revert to just the way it was before? Or do you think that, that some of the things that each of you has discussed might become part of the new normal in terms of what happens in school? I, I'll, I'll jump in initially. I think that 
there are far too many opportunities that we have seen over the last nine weeks with, with children um, having more agency to allow us to let it revert back perhaps to the way um, it was prior to, to COVID-19. I think uh, it's incumbent upon us as professionals when the children come back into the building to really look at the way that we're going about engaging the children in, in the learning process. And I think that we certainly are, are really trying to identify what are going to be the takeaways that we want to keep. And we're looking at that uh, in, in relation to spaces, learning spaces, uh, access to technology, perhaps what's been a quite a rigid model of delivery at school needs to be loosened up. Uh, we're thinking about flexible models of delivery, uh, teaching staff who are doing incredible things with um, short video content input and then children self-managing and moving away from that and having some choice. So voice choice and ownership for children are absolutely essential. And there's certainly some things, Chris, that we would want to be thinking about so that we can retain those because I think if we could it would allow us to build on and reshape perhaps what learning has traditionally looked like uh, within the four walls of a building. I would I would just add to that that you know we're looking at how can we continue to move people around having people remotely accessible and available to us I mean rather than having this this Middle East um, expert on, on our campus why not having them in the Middle East where then they're working with the people they need to be working with and having students there too. So those students who are passionate and able to then add a lot of value to these projects, they should be there. And then our program could be nimble and agile and remote for them to continue their education along through us and with us. And, and hopefully then including many other people. Okay, um, from my observation, actually, for those, uh, because what I observed is most from the public schools. Yeah, uh, most of them just uh, have this kind of expe expectation. Ex actually, everything will resume. <laughs> yeah, resume to the back to the normal. Yeah, that is back to the normal rather than new normal. However, from uh, because those are public uh, schools, they have to do things around the, the national curriculum and they have this kind of prescribed uh, content. And if they have any standard test that they have to follow, yes, they so they have this kind of uh, fear or worries about this kind of uh, mm, the content centered. Uh, however, I think that from the government, they got this kind of a strategic thinking that how can we um, use this um, technology and also the takeaways of this uh, period experiments and try to um, incorporate them into this kind of regular uh, schooling system. So uh, although individual schools, they may not do, the individual public schools, they may not do a lot of things. However, we will see this will be kind of a, a new trend or direction from the government, from the top down. Yeah, try to push this more blended learning or more um, technology or this um, online based learning. Yeah. I just have a question. Do you think do you think that there's going to be a push from the from from the top public schools to then be more available and sharing resources to then the uh, lesser tier cities and then their schools? I mean, if you think about Beida Fujong and Renda Fujong, um, Beijing National Day, Beijing Normal Exper Experimental, these top schools that yield then the best uh, Gaokao or Junkao results, then is there going to be pressure from the government to them to then be sharing those resources virtually and or other for these for these students in in um, different cities, districts, and schools with less less resources and or support. Yeah, I think this is the one um, one kind of, the, the one type of this sharing. Yeah, and also this is a one type of this strategy because they now they are doing this for on the national resource, they are have already um, amounted, accumulated those resources from like Tsinghua uh, affiliated schools and from Shanghai, they have already uh, used those from those uh, top schools. So this is one. Uh, one kind of possibility they are um, required to share uh, these uh, key resources. Young, do you have a, another point you want to make? Yeah, I was just going to raise another point. Uh, but before that, I just want to quickly say this. I think you probably see, I, I think Scott has observed uh, in the chat room that about the, the different reactions as a large government system 
and how do you react to this and uh, and how this might change versus independent more versatile school systems and uh, and but i think a good point what strong was ra raising is that uh, what is considered normal education return to normal which is kind of interesting you know uh, i just wrote a blog about that we cannot think uh, online as a lesser cousin of uh, of normal so that's uh, this abnormal uh, but it's interesting uh, the challenge i just want to raise one new direction and uh, you may or may not answer this but for other people to think about this uh, you know from what chris was talking about online is different well we are going to rethink about paring down the traditional curriculum it helps us to challenge the traditional practices and thinking about curriculum and pedagogy of teaching I always want to say this creates a new opportunity for something schools have not been doing, have missing. For example, uh, we talk about global competency, understanding human beings in other places. This is a great opportunity to do that. Developing digital competency, learning how to socialize online, how to self-regulate online, that has not been you know, on the high end of this. And more like me and I are talking more autonomy, more entrepreneurial thinking, more manage of your own learning. We did not have time to do all of those. I think this presents an opportunity to do that. And our final point is that we kept talking about family school connection. This is the time actually schools and family have to be connected and co collaborating. And that's another place where we can explore different possibilities. And, uh, but I, I would get you know, back to, uh, to our, uh, our host, uh, Chris, to determine if you want to pursue those questions. But I want to raise that for all our audience to think about new potentials, new possibilities, uh, beside what one get rid of, but also what we can add on add to this whole new mix. Well, I'm happy for any of our guests to talk about any piece of that big, interesting set of questions. Uh, yes, I just want to share one um a case, a school case that is uh, using this um, historical pandemic, this period as a teachable moment. Actually, from the principal and to their teachers, they have invented this kind of a school-based inquiry, uh, issue-based inquiry project week because usually they got this kind of uh, uh, project week just for one week they will have this kind of theme and new theme however i suggest them okay see why don't we use this kind of as a uh, a, a a kind of a natural inquiry and for the students to do that then. So within one week, they designed a kind of a guiding framework for the different grades in primary. So they, for the primary one, they were dealing with the, how a human with animals uh, and the later on all been setting up or contextualized in this uh, COVID-19. And uh, in the two weeks, the whole school is just doing this kind of issue-based inquiry uh, as a class uh, based and then the group based and then they have the final project. So in this type of um, uh, uh, new uh, school-based curriculum, and they just combined their uh, regular, uh, this uh, routine, school routine to do this a uh, project. However, uh, and also include this as a new uh, issues and the students and the parents, they are uh, they were very happy to join. And also for teachers, they felt very excited. So I think this is, there are, real cases they can do it if they would like to make it as a teachable moment and use it as a kind of a potential for new type of learning or kind of a, uh, other uh, higher ends. Yeah. I, I would just want to add that I think that we need to all wake up and see this as an opportunity that all the students and the faculty have to extend the knowledge and skills, the, the curriculum to then outside projects that are going to be meaningful and, and change and better the world. We can no longer be thinking about how do we assess the students again through these quizzes and exams where then we have these you know, this numerical data that we're going to then share with the universities, you know, and all the students look the same, you know, and the only thing to distinguish or di differentiate them is going to be then that number, that figure. You know, I mean, all these students are taking the exact same classes as their peers. I think we need to stop and wake up and think, how can this individual be their true and authentic self where they can play to their strengths, follow their passions and interests, where then because they like design and art and math, then they're working with architects, but they're, but they're focused on projects that are gonna be beneficial, perhaps working with the 
the influx of, of people who are then migrant workers so that there's a livable space there where there's um, good lighting and there's clean water and there's air circulation. I think that we need to, to wake up and break down the walls of the school. And during that school day, why are they even in our school? Why aren't they working with different people on different projects? And then they could be accessing their, their teaching and learning their faculty remotely or in the face-to-face -face through office hours. I think that hopefully it doesn't go back to the to the normal. I think that we should look at this and be like, okay, we can do something different. We can do things more meaningful. And if we empower our students and we empower our, our faculty, they can change the world. I've seen it. I was ready to leave education until I, till I stumbled on this school. And now I've sort of, I've woken up, you know what I mean? It's almost like a religious thing that you see that what students and faculty are capable if you empower them and you entrust them and you don't inundate them. So one point that I want to make sure that we bring up Many of the comments in the chat are about what happens to the most marginalized of students, poor students, students from rural areas, students from marginalized groups, students with special needs. And those are very important questions. But I also think that it's very important that we not approach this from a deficit perspective, which I see a lot of in, in the United States. These are not students who are broken. They know a lot. Rural, rural students actually know a lot that urban students do not. Uh, poor families often know a lot and have tremendous tenacity and commitment to education that perhaps more affluent families don't. And I, I want to make sure that the empowerment that we talk about, where we're empowering parents and we're empowering students and and we're empowering all the stakeholders to get together and reinvent what's going on in education. That needs to be empowerment that marginalized people have the same voice and the same sense of a lot to contribute uh, as, as everybody else. So I, I just want to say a few things. We're getting towards the end. Uh, first, I want to thank the three of you as guests. It, it's not easy to come on to a show like this and to, to control what you want to say to make it headlines rather than long talks and to have a conversation and to share what isn't working as well as what is working. And you've just been fabulous. This has been a great, I think a great episode and, and a wonderful conversation among us. And this is exactly the kind of thing that we want to do with this initiative. Um, next week, we have another very exciting episode. Uh, the Commonwealth of Learning is a global group that cuts across all of these national boundaries and national systems. And they both uh, are very active in adult capacity building, educator professional development, and also in open educational resources. So I think they have a lot of interesting models to contribute as we put together alternative ways of handling the crisis. I hope that those of you who are here this week will tune in. More details are in the blog section of the website about what that episode will be like. Um, something else that's happened that's exciting is that we're starting to get guest blog posts. Uh, for the site. And Scott, do you want to just say briefly a little bit about that if somebody is thinking about doing a guest blog post for us? Sure, absolutely. So if you go to silverliningforlearning.org and you click on the contact link at the very top navigation menu, uh, there's a way to get in touch with us if you'd like to be a guest blogger. And we have a prompt paragraph there for you to respond to. Um, and then you would just contact us and we'll set you up with an account and get your blog in. Thanks. <laughs> and, and again, in blogs, we're, we're not looking for sort of a solution. We're looking for your thoughts about parts of models that seem to be working well that you'd like to share with other people. Uh, I have a student in, in our master's program who is very concerned about India, wh where she's from. And I said, well, why don't you do a blog post that talks about both the opportunities and challenges you see in India now? And I said, at the end of the blog post, put a way that, that you and, and other people who read it and agree with you can organize together. 
so that you can you can form a group out of this that that moves to taking action. And I think that's a big goal that all of us have as organizers. It's it's great to have these episodes and to learn from one another, but we also have the opportunity to meet other people who have the same passions that we do, who complement one another in terms of what they know about what this the solutions for different kinds of problems might be. And we really want to encourage you to go beyond the episodes themselves and and see yourselves as stakeholders and having agency and shaping what's going on in this silver lining for learning group. So think about blog posts, think about contacting people that you meet in chat, think about ways that we can all band together and make a big difference. So thank you all again for coming. We're excited about next week. We hope to get some blog posts in the meantime, and please tweet, 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 use social media, give us a plug. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.